we are hardwired to try and uh, transcend, to overcome, to be of service on some kind of higher level, to transform and to use all of our tools and our, our DNA and our sinew to make uh, brave and beautiful and good things. It feels, because I've been listening to you and reading you and just wandering around my neighborhood, listening to your audiobooks, having my spiritual thoughts and hopes and dreams, it feels like I, you're going to have to forgive the amount that I feel like I know you, so <laughs> okay. thank you. Also, I have the overwhelming desire to get comfortable because I have 200 questions. Okay, sorry. let's do it. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think we're maybe um, ish, 10 years apart, and my parents were also hippies, but your parents were hippies before hippies were hippies. Yeah, pre, pre, pre-hippie, proto-hippie. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Tell me a bit about their kind of early questing selves. Yeah, they essentially, my parents were farm kids uh, who found themselves in Seattle in the uh, mid '60s, yeah. and uh, they were a little bit more in the in the beatnik uh, line of things. So my dad uh, painted uh, murals and wanted to be Mark Toby, the uh, kind of abstract expressionist painter. They lived on a houseboat uh, in Seattle and Lake Union. And my mom uh, did experimental theater where she, in one play, uh, painted her naked torso blue and ran, to ra- ran around in the audience. <laughs> yeah. Which is what we're here to do today. Today, <laughs> yes. I'm already warm. This is, a first, this is a first ever for Fetzer. So <laughs> Camera's out, everyone. We're all going to participate. <laughs> Ring the bell. <laughs> That's awesome. I loved your um, like a house, like the, it was like all the choices: the houseboat choice, yeah. mm-hmm. the art choice, yeah. your dad's real like sci-fi side. Yeah. Tell me some of the sample titles of his works. Yeah. So my dad on the side, uh, he, it's a it's a very strange uh, upbringing because my dad was very working class blue collar. He spent his whole life either as like a line cook or a school teacher, but mostly like managing a sewer construction company. And on the side, painting abstract oil paintings, listening to opera, singing at the top of his lungs. And as if that wasn't enough, he had a secret hobby of writing science fiction novels. So he wrote gosh, 10 or 12 sci-fi novels. He only got one of them published, uh, Tentacles of Dawn, major books, 1976. Um, We got a check for $500 for that book. And uh, there's a a picture, I think, in The Bassoon King of us holding that up. That was more money than our family had had. It was like, oh my gosh, we can buy shoes because we were were pretty poor in Seattle. I grew up... uh, drinking powdered milk instead of milk because it was cheaper and getting my clothes from the Salvation Army. And, uh, but my dad had all kinds of titles of science fiction books. Um, I can't remember. You probably remember some of the... There was The Ghosts of E, Clarissa of Doom. Um, what else? What else? There's so many. It's, it's just like galactic zombies and, yeah. you know, anything you can imagine. I love the yeah. world-buildingness of it. Yeah. The, like... Like remaking the world through total imaginary mm. post-apocalyptic or pre-apocalyptic. Yeah, completely. Gorgeous yeah. madness. On a, and like I imagine on a typewriter, just like, he was on a typewriter, and that that's nuts. Yeah. Think about writing, yeah. you know, Clarissa of Doom on a typewriter. <laughs> you know, it's hard enough to write Clarissa of Doom, you know, even on a some kind of word processor, but. Uh, and it's in, in it's it's interesting with my dad because and um, I'm gonna, I'm going to jump ahead to something uh, uh, a little more uh, profound. But when I think back on my dad, like he loved the creative process. Yeah. He just loved being creative. I think he was told his whole life he had a very traumatic childhood. His mom died under just horrific circumstances. His dad was the worst dad known to humanity, and he just. So it was all about, like, at work, he would secretly type science fiction novels when he wasn't sending sewer construction trucks out to the, you know, the leafy-clogged drains of Seattle. 
And, um, and then he'd come home and he'd paint these abstract oils. But for him, it was the process of creation. Of, he didn't really, he would, he would have loved to have been discovered, but he wanted to do zero of the work of like trying to take his books out and his paintings out. And I used to say to him when I was like 11 years old, like, Dad, you got all these paintings. Why don't you take them out to the galleries? There's all those galleries downtown. And like, oh, they don't want this. They blah, 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 blah. And, and so when I chose to become an artist or an actor and I fell in love with theater, I kind of knew what I was up against. Uh-huh. So it was a, it was a, I had a very different perspective because when you have a parent that... Yes. Um, and yeah, who longs yeah. for a discovery and acceptance yeah. and, and success but doesn't want to put in the effort yeah. um, because of fear and insecurity yeah. and trauma and whatnot, I knew, like, if I'm going to do this, I have to go all in. So oh. it, was, it was about, like, I'm going to New York City. I'm going to go to the best school. Yeah. I'm going to apprentice. I'm going to learn from the best. I'm going to put myself out there. Yeah. And uh, for better or worse... Um, Having had my father as a as a kind of a reflection of another path that that did kind of help me ultimately in my career. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's a um, I don't want to ask this if it's because I've seen people create like they just they baby being born make something out of so I love the kind of like furious hope that. I can hear when you describe your dad's mm. Mm. like prolific mm. love of like sci-fi or art or but just the like the kind of gnawing yeah. loving making. Do you think there's a is there always a grief in that or because I I'm I have a very creative dad. My dad has made many things that have never seen the light of day. Mm. There's been a lot of early typewriter in nice. my life. Yeah. And I've often wondered if creativity always has like a lightly tragic feeling because it there's so much hope in the making and then there's sometimes just like just hope in the also wanting to give it to somebody else to experience. Too. Mm. Mm. Well, I think that's an awesome question and I do believe that we in seeking the divine, we seek to emulate the, the powers and kind of facets of, of the divine and imagination and creativity is one of the great powers of God. In the Baha'i faith, God is often referred to as the fashioner, and I love that word, fashioner, that when we fashion whatever it is um, in, the, in the creative impulse, we are emulating a divine spark and so and there's a there is an element of that in that art is service if you make someone laugh that's a service if you make something beautiful that is a service and and this is that is a divine impulse as well is is obviously to be of service you can you can give someone soup if they're hungry that's service but you can also make a beautiful poem that brings solace to someone's heart and that's also service but my dad's definitely was born out of trauma. So, uh, and I think that's okay. I think both can live side by side. But I think for him, art and creation was his way out of his traumatic childhood. For instance, he always just loved classical music. Like I said, he was always playing classical records and listening to classical uh, radio stations and whatnot. In fact, we lived as uh, Baha'i pioneers. I know you're going to get to that. Uh, in uh, which is similar to missionary work, um, although we like to think Baha'is like to think they're not there to convert the natives, but more to kind of like work in the community. Mm-hmm. And we lived in Bluefields, Nicaragua, on the Mosquito Coast for three years when I was a when I was a kid. And my dad brought his classical albums, and he had a classical music radio show at the <laughs> Bluefields, Nicaragua radio station, <laughs> which, believe it or not, did not play the kind of music that you would normally. A tribute to a radio station, an AM radio station in Bluefields, Nicaragua. Mostly what they played there, yeah. country music. Stop. Country music was huge in coastal Nicaragua in the 1970s. And uh, his daddy's like, y'all ready for this? <laughs> uh, 
Chopin, y'all. Uh, so, uh, but it's interesting because one time I, then I asked him like, yeah. you know, why, why do you love classical music so much? And it boiled down to this. This is cray cray. His mom died under the most horrific yeah. circumstances. He was like eight or nine years old. She bequested to him her classical music collection. So for him, as this kind of destitute Illinois farm boy with a stack of classical music records, and I think a little, I imagine a little turntable, that was his, his solace and, and his escape, and, it, and he clung to that for his entire life. The way we kind of like bear witness to other people's loves in our own loves, where we like, no, I'll carry it with you, I'll, I'll carry it with me in my heart, kind of feeling. Mm. I remember seeing my, my, my dad and his mom were so utterly different, and most of his young life had been marked by the tragedy of her early near fatal tuberculosis, which meant that she was shuttered in a sanitarium for a long time. And so there's this like early. Okay, that's crazy because that's yeah. that's the circumstances that my yes, dad right. had. Yeah, I totally. Yeah, my just... dad's mom was had tuberculosis and was in the sanitarium, sanitarium, yeah. sanatorium. And it's out of it's these places are tucked away because they expect them never to. Yeah. Emerge. Yeah. Yeah, so but continue. They're, kind, they're just like living museums of their own life mm. while they're still. Mm. And at the time, right, it was wildly incurable, and so yeah. they. And so there's just so much um, hopelessness and deep sadness and separation and mm. why is it my mom here when my mom should be here? And um, but when uh, and she should have gone to college, and so then he became the one who was obsessed with going to college to kind of carry this legacy of mm. this beautifully, wildly intelligent person who never got to like sort of be the flowering fruit of the whole thing. Mm. But I thought maybe the most touching thing I saw them do later in life when he wrote this absolutely impenetrable dissertation on Tudor history. And my <laughs> and my grandma, who'd had like a huge Nothing chunk says of her, love like an impenetrable <laughs> history of the Tudors. And it, and it would like remember those printers that was like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you had to like perforate off the side yeah, yeah, for yeah. about forty years of your life. Um, making a happy birthday banner was like a two-hour process. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, I could see them trying then to kind of cross the huge bridge to each other, separated by so many things. And at that point, she'd had a lot of her lungs cut out because that had been the cure, too. But she was living in rural Saskatchewan, and she, um, and she it took her, I think, about a year. But she embroidered a Elizabeth the first like subject of his dissertation ordered in freshwater pearls and I'm like I think there's just so when I picture your dad in a radio station Nicaragua playing like making sure that the string quartets get their time on the air mm -hmm. there's just something so wild about the way we like carry our loves for each other mm -hmm. and then we need to express it Mm. Like you got to sing that song or embroider that. Mm. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think it would be possible for me to do justice to your Nicaraguan childhood. Mm -hmm. Because if we were playing the game like Two Truths and a Lie, mm -hmm. like it, no, you can't tell. You couldn't tell. So no. if you wouldn't mind offering some seemingly contextless fact experience <laughs> in which you're like, would you believe that this is yeah. was my time, my life at that time? Yeah. Well, my uh, stepmother almost died in quicksand. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I, was, I had my full understanding face on. And I, it was that fun. threw you. That yeah, got really you. Really sorry. <laughs> it zagged. But what a way to go, though. I mean, there's part of me that wishes that that's how she would have died. Um, she's in a senior home in Bainbridge Island, Washington now, and I'm glad she's lived a full, rich life. Don't get me wrong. But what a way to go. I mean, you, can you imagine the stories I would be telling oh if my gosh. stepmom had actually died in quicksand? So, no, it's not the Princess Bride. It's actually, <laughs> yeah. it's actually my But yeah, one, one of her legs went all the way up to her hip. It was a very awkward 
thing, and then her other leg was out, and then some friendly Nicaraguans threw her a branch, and like, and she was like pulled her out. But that was that's a minor story. That's that it gets way uh, it gets way more intense than that. It was uh, you know shaking the scorpions and spiders out of your shoes every morning. Um, the amount of uh, my dad had malaria. I had amoebic dysentery. I think can is it possible on your? I'm not sure that I haven't listened to your podcast, and I don't know you much about it. the Fetzer Institute. You can say it. But I want you to say it. I had multiple worms come out of my butt. Uh, so that's that was an interesting. In fact, it's one of the most like visceral memories of my childhood are very long worms emerging from my anus. So, God bless us, everyone. Um, but uh, what else can I say? I will say that on a, on a lighter note, we had a, uh, we had a pet sloth, um, and he, we kept him in a cage, and every night... Um, sloths are very strong and very slow. Every night he would <laughs> open the bars of the cage and he would escape. And every morning my dad would go out knowing that he can't have made it further than 30 feet from the cage <laughs> and circle the yard looking around the bushes and sure enough there would be the sloth and he would grab it, put it back in the cage, <laughs> bend the bars back. There's and like that a, says a lot about the human experience. I was say, it's like a full Sisyphean drama yep. every day. Every of day. Him almost yep. escaping. He's like, I'm almost, I'm, oh, damn it. Oh. <laughs> Dragged back. Dragged back, yeah. Because mm-hmm. I kind of have a theory uh, about, uh, secret theory about you that I'm hoping you'll be like, yes, that's very personal. Okay. Or, no, that's absolutely uh, unprovable. Um, but your genuine weirdness, uh, she said respectfully. Hey, hey, respectfully, hey. Respectfully. I, I think there is something about being a curious adult that has to do with being able to accept the surreal. In like when things just you know ex- everyone expects a linear life and you're just used to things coming into view fully through your peripheral. I just imagine that that has led to like a well, I suppose this is what's happening mm. approach mm. Okay. to life. Yeah, I think there's some spiritual magic in that. Oh, I, I would say that's very astute. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think you know by the time you know by the time I'm in American elementary school, you know I've seen and been through yeah. a lot, yeah. and my family is extremely eccentric and um uh so it's kind of like hey anything goes yeah yeah it's hard to be uncurious having that background yes there is a thing too about the way you describe your family growing up about the outsiderness of Mm -hmm. knowing that some parts of family life were like deeply loving and other parts were missing Mm mm-hmm yeah and that you'd have to find them. You'd have. It took you a while to find out that those were those pieces were actually kind of essential. <laughs> You're like, oh no, I'm gonna need, to yeah. know, intimacy, connection. Yeah, yeah. How long did you feel the kind of missing pieces for? Until my late forties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh no, <laughs> it's true. I because uh, the big piece missing from my from the childhood that we haven't mentioned so far is that my mom left me and my dad, when she was doing the plays where she painted her torso blue, she went and had an affair with the theater director and left, and I was about a year and a half, two years old. So uh, I didn't really see her again until I was about 15. So, um, and my dad remarried right away. And so there were, there was a lot of like, uh, there was a lot of those missing pieces. And the difficulty was, and I think that people of faith often really relate to this, which is, um, by the way, we're all people of faith. We just maybe have faith in different things. People of faith can relate to the fact that there was this kind of like, like 
this cognitive dissonance, but I would call it an emotional dissonance, uh, having to do with uh, the idea that we were Baha'is, members of the Baha'i faith. And if you know anything about the Baha'i faith, it's just love and unity straight down the middle. It's, it's love and unity, but in, our, in my home life with my dad and stepmom, because they did, really did not have a very uh, good marriage uh, or loving marriage, um, we talked about love and unity a lot and expressed it in a church community context, but I didn't feel it at home. So there was this very odd disconnect between that. And also I was not receiving the kind of emotional nourishment that I needed as, as a child. So, and when I say, you know, late forties, I, I really mean that. I really mean like it took me a lot of, a lot of therapy and a lot of 12 step to kind of get to some kind of like adult healing of, of, of recognizing what it is that I, that I really needed. So it was, it uh, was a very peculiar kind of trauma to have um, parents that were fighting, either fighting or not talking to each other, um, but then going, you know, a couple times a week to Baha'i gatherings where yeah. we would be singing, you know, Kumbaya like songs. Yeah. So that was uh, difficult to uh, to navigate. Yeah, it sounds like the the vocational pull toward creativity did a lot of good work in you. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh mm -hmm. my gosh, you're gonna take the outsiderness that you feel. You're mm -hmm. gonna take the, and you're gonna practice being really, really good at something in groups with other people who also love the vulnerability. Of public awareness, which is how I, I guess I'm prescribing acting. That's the that's the that's theater kids. That's theater nerds right there. Once I found, yeah, I so the, in going back to the outsiderness of it all. The um, uh, first of all, I'm just wired a little bit weird, so that's okay. And then it was a lamp for Halloween. It was like, what will you be? I was soccer team. Then I was wow. a lamp. Yeah. Then I was <laughs> yeah. very unpopular. <laughs> Which I still feel as like essential. Team. I can't even remember what my uh, uh, what my Halloween costumes were, but that that's great. That that reveals a lot. But um, <laughs> the one of the things that I, I remember doing in junior high school, and maybe we can all relate to this at some level, was like I was so alien growing up in Nicaragua. Baha'i family, dad writing weird science fiction novels, um, and, uh, and, and a lot of nerdy pursuits, a lot of opera playing in our, in our house. Um, yeah. I was on the chess team. I played the bassoon. I was in Model United Nations. I mean, my nerd cred is through the roof. But I would observe other kids and how they behaved and, uh, and, and try and emulate that. So if you had a cool kid who was like coming up to someone else, like he was like, hey, Johnny, how's it going? And slap him on the shoulder, like, how was your weekend, bro? And yeah. I, would, I would observe that and be like, okay. And then I would go. Subject to, A. I, <laughs> subject yeah, then I would go up to my friend Mike, like, hey, Mike, how was your weekend, bro? <laughs> you know, and, and I would literally try and emulate it. Yeah. So that didn't help matters much. <laughs> but but that's, that's how I felt. But then when I found... The theater and children of the theater, yeah. those are the ultimate outsiders. Um, and uh, I really found, I found a home and a, yeah. and a place to belong and a, and a great channel for, for, my, for my creativity. Yeah. yeah. Did you recognize it as a vocation? Like not just a job, like a, like a, a calling that aligned you with a certain, I'm just curious about how you thought, like, did you think, oh, this internally matched my gifts? Or at the time, did you think, this is, there's something transcend, like, transcendent going on? I was an evangelical experimental theater artist. Uh -huh. So <laughs> when I left the Baha'i faith when I was about 20, and I left it hardcore, I was like, I didn't want anything to do with God, religion, morality, any of that mumbo jumbo nonsense. I just wanted to be an artist in New York City. I was living my dream. But we had the same evangelical fervor about the theater that someone would have about any religious yeah. practice. So we really thought that we could change people's minds and hearts if we did the right production of 
Miss Julie or the three sisters in the right church basement to the right 37 people, <laughs> that we could literally change the course of their lives. And that was the, the fervor and the mission with which we undertook the making of theater, which I think is the only way to make theater, because it certainly doesn't pay. And But it was about... Uh, blowing people's minds, it was about new forms, it was about making them laugh in unique ways, it was, uh, uh, and we would have the most intense conversations yeah. about the making of theater and, and its importance. And, uh, you know, we, I remember having a conversation once about, you know, it was late at night and a bunch of us theater artists and we were pondering things and someone said, would you ever do a commercial? <laughs> <laughs> and someone very seriously and very sonorously said, I would if it were for soy milk. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a great way to do that was a great way to do theater yeah. because it and it, it is and this is the human this is the natural human input, impetus toward transcendence that we uh, we are wired, yeah. we are hardwired to try and uh, transcend, to overcome, to be of service on some kind of higher level, yeah. to um, to transform and to use all of our tools and our, our DNA and our sinew to make uh, brave and beautiful and good things. And you can meet educators that are that way. You can meet health practitioners that are that way. You can, you know, meet people in you know, architects have to think in that way. Like, I'm going to make a space that's going to transform people. When they enter that space, they're going to see the world differently. We want to aspire toward that. And kind of everything in contemporary society wants to keep us back from thinking in that way. So I think it's really important to think, think brave and think big and think transcendent. Mm -hmm. Was it in your late 20s that you were... Are you worried about like I think you describe it as like deaths by despair, like the feeling that you all can feel vocationally alive and yet there are these sort of darker selves that want to kind of gnaw at you and suck away your purpose. I talk a lot about these days when I go to college campuses and whatnot. I talk a lot about mental health because I do think that the the current mental health epidemic is. Uh, super deadly and uh, overwhelming. And I, I think people over 40 or 50 really don't understand how deep and dark and deadly it is. It is, it is horrific. Uh, Dr. Varun Soni is the chaplain at USC, who's a dear friend of mine. He describes going three times a week to either funerals of kids that have committed suicide or hospital beds of kids that have attempted suicide. This is really, really bad. And the, the kids who are on the front lines of these mental health epidemics, one of the bombs, one of the solutions that they most need uh, are spiritual tools and spiritual connection, uh, which can give someone vision, mission, and purpose, and a, a sense of that, seeking the sublime, the sacred, the transcendent. Um, and there is a, there's a longing and a hunger for that. So the, my way into that is that in my 20s, I experienced a lot of this stuff firsthand. So I uh, realize now, we didn't have words for it in the, in the mid-90s for a mental health epidemic, but I was having crippling anxiety attacks uh, for years that would render me sometimes on the floor like shaking and sweating. And they would, it would come on at really the most inopportune times and I realized that I was using a lot of drugs and alcohol during that time to just try and medicate this anxiety, which is very common in, in the modern world as well. I, I wrestled with addiction, certainly depression, uh, anxiety and alienation and, um, and loneliness. And, um, and these are all elements of the diseases of despair, not my phrase, you know, phrases that are used by, you know, positive psychologists to talk about um, what's happening in, to, to the youth today. And diseases of despair also can include um, what's happening on, on social media and the kind of like um, device, uh, dopamine delivery devices uh, 
uh, and platforms and apps and the, and the isolation that those things engender. So um, this is uh, an area of great interest to me. It's something that I relate to because I've experienced it and something I think anyone who's, uh, you know, writing about uh, spiritual topics has to, has to take into you know, deep and profound consideration. Yeah. Can you walk me back on that phrase you said uh, about when you talk to college kids about like the path through? One of them was service, and there are two others. It was really good. I think it's it's just simply being a part of something larger than yourself. I think humans long to be a part of something larger than themselves, mm -hmm. and everything in contemporary society is saying the self is the most important thing. Yeah, you and I really do share a profound concern that there is a religious worldview that's in competition with <laughs> the one you're describing. And that's like a very narrow view of self-help. I've been writing a history of self-help and the kind of language of, mm -hmm. um, you know, just a, a, aggressive individualism. Mm -hmm. And then most solutions to what you're describing, they would counter with is like, well, more me time, there's a lot of, especially it's like the religion of Instagram for women is a lot of aggressive bubble bathing <laughs> into, you just lock yourself in the bathroom for two minutes a yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, I have it's, a big problem with self-care, with the, with the idea of self-care, because, uh, you know, Seligman had a, you know, I had one of his earliest classes all take a, a test for to uh, of of their happiness to get a baseline, and then one weekend he told the kids to go out and do everything that they think is going to make them happier, and come in and share about it. And some kids like hooked up, and other kids got wasted. Kids went to Atlantic City. Other kids like went on a shopping spree. Blah blah blah. They took the happiness test again, and of course, guess what? Yeah. Their happiness scores were lower. Yeah. Then he had another weekend where it's like, go do something for some someone else. Go be of service, whether it's call your sick aunt or visit a friend who's hurting or hold the door open at a Starbucks or whatever it is. And they took the test again, and guess what? Their scores were higher. So, you know, scientists have understood that it's by getting out of oneself, actually, that we find greater well-being. Um, and I, I think that what has happened is because we live in such a consumerist capitalist society that we want uh, an immediate payback uh, for our investment, right? So spirituality has become kind of codified into something that will re simply relieve my anxiety and bring me, you know, 8% more serenity on a daily basis. So you talked about like, if I read this Rumi poem on Instagram yeah. and I take the hardcore bubble bath and I do my yoga class, then I will be 8% less anxious uh, in my day. And so I've paid my money, I've invested my time, and I have gotten this payback of an 8% greater serenity. And that way of thinking is corrupt profoundly at its core. So there's nothing wrong with seeking some peace in your life. And I do it, you do it, I'm sure. You know, my prayer and meditation practice, connecting with nature, even cold plunges and gratitude lists, which I do on an almost daily basis. There's nothing wrong with these things as long as they're in the service to something greater. And I think that we, you know, culturally, uh, part of what a spiritual revolution means is really thinking outside of the box on kind of like how we do most everything, how systems work. So we have a system of seeking to obtain spiritual enlightenment or peace or centeredness or serenity and it's it's it works completely within yeah. within the bounds of consumerism. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, it's like it's wild how instrumentalist all the language sounds. I mean, it really is. I don't know what instrumentalist means. You make everything. I'm a bassoonist. Is that is that anything? <laughs> you do know the power of an instrument. Yes. yes. No, just That's making what she everything. <laughs> We've done that's the first, we've that's done. what she said joke ever told in the Fetzer Institute. <laughs> Boom. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Huge mic drop. <laughs> the idea that everything, I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a version of American pragmatism 
where everything has to be for something. So exactly what you're describing about like why it's got this, like why, just another version of a language of why it's so corrupt is because we've taken a thing that is a that is good for its own sake. Beauty doesn't need to be proven as being instrumentalist for um, truth-telling, friendship. It shouldn't have to be social scientists agree <laughs> that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we make everything into a tool and so therefore everything is some kind of has a use or an exchange mm, mm. and then it makes it makes all the beautiful things part of a a wellness morning routine or a, mm-hmm. um, a story about us trying to get what we deserve mm, mm. and I, I really like um, a psychologist Lisa DeMore is so lovely because she writes about adolescent mental health I think you'd really like her mm. she the first chunk of her book is like can we just talk about some of the limits of our obsession with positivity, especially when it relates to the mental health of adolescents. Hmm. She makes two great points. One is that mental health is not trying to crowd all the emotions into our cultural obsession with like happiness, but it's having the appropriate emotion at the appropriate time. So hmm. in some cases, it is if a terrible thing happens, you're yeah. the appropriate emotion is feel sadness. terrible emotions. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And like as it but as opposed to just crowding on one sort of end of the swimming pool and the other is in order to like guide adolescents through the wide the ups and downs she's like they're the the the, the fastest way to create like more um agility is is just service Mm. it's just putting them so your point about like you just make them part of something that's bigger than themselves Mm -hmm. and there's Mm -hmm. like a natural i think of it like those really weighted blankets Mm. Where you're just like, oh yeah, no, it's not about me. It's fine. Mm. <laughs> just, mm. But it is wild how much service is. Like it's not a sexy topic right now. Mm-hmm. Like I'm excited for you as you try to talk people into it. Yeah, they're not. They're Wish not, me luck. They're not loving yeah. it. Yeah, I believe that the solution to the youth mental health crisis is has been around since the late seventies. And its name is Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> because when you play D&D, you're in a group of people without devices, yeah. shoulder to shoulder, snacks, <laughs> a lot of jocularity, a lot of high fives. <laughs> you're in service to something greater. You're taking your little retinue of elves and dwarves and magic users and wizards and monks, and you're seeking the treasure, and you're on a mission. You've got to work together. Uh, there's... Uh, there's basically everything that one used to find in a religion, one can find uh, in a group of uh, kids playing Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, it's uh, when I know like my son is doing better is when he's playing a lot of d and I'm yeah. like, okay, all right, all right, you're on the right path. Like, weekend of orc slaying is a go. Yep, yeah. <laughs> but the other thing I was thinking, encouragement is maybe the, the most pure service that we can offer another person. You know, I mean, I think that love, love is interesting uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a concept, but I think also culturally we, yeah. I, I think we struggle to understand, believe it or not, I think we struggle to understand what love is yeah. because we only have one English language word for love yeah. and so many other languages I, I hear, I don't know, the Sanskrit has like 19 yeah. words for love. Yeah. And, you know, I love you know, the New York Knicks, and I love my wife, and I love God, and I love skateboarding videos from the 70s, but that's not, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) that's not really love. And um, so love isn't a feeling in the chest. Love is in an action. It's only born out in action. There's, Mm -hmm. it's, it it doesn't even really matter what, what the internal impulse is for that action, but encouragement of another person, I think, is, is, one of the most sincere and pure acts of love. I like how into virtues you are, because you're very, because that's, I mean, I think it's a very good argument to say, like, how do we know that what we're doing, like, love is, is real love, Mm -hmm. and, like, because it produces these beautiful qualities, like, as opposed to, I became more emotionally regulated (laughs) by myself. (laughs) So I, I love that you also are like, no, no, there's, like, we do have great language for this. Like hmm. patience, forbearance, joy. Who do you think, or what do you think we would all be like if we did have a spiritual revolution? 
What are things that you would like, you'd look around and you'd see what? Well, I think that um, at the core of any spiritual revolution is uh, uh, compassion. And I talk about in Soul Boom, uh, what, what would it be like to invent a compassion machine where you can go into the machine and it's wired to your brain, it looks like an MRI machine or something like that, and in it, you're immediately put in the circumstances of an immigrant at the border or an Afghani you know, sheep herder or a Vietnamese fisherman trying to get by, whatever it is, the circumstances, someone wildly different than yourself, yeah. and you enter their world and you see and feel the world exactly as they do because that would be the ultimate way to kind of like foster compassion. So with deep compassion yeah. comes sacrifice, personal sacrifice. Yeah. So um, when we have a family member who's sick, we have incredibly deep compassion for that family member. We'll quit our jobs to take care of them, right? We'll do anything. We'll, we'll, we'll drain our bank accounts, you know, because we love them so much. But as too often happens, we stop that apparatus at the boundaries of family. So increasing the, uh, how we define family to, and then to increase it, not just to our tribe, not just to kind of like fellow Anabaptists who live in Raleigh, Durham, you know, but, but to, to go, you know, to people with different skin colors or who speak different languages and who uh, maybe think about the world in a different way politically than we do to ever increasing kind of universality of compassion where we drain our bank accounts and sacrifice our time, our energy, and especially our comfort. We sacrifice those bubble baths uh, for the good of someone else. Yeah. So what does that look like? It looks like any great religious spiritual movement. Like you look at the early Christian movement of the first 300 years and the, the writers of the time were outraged and perplexed that there were these people that were Sumerians and Romans and, and they were you know centurions and they were former slaves and former prostitutes and they were not only helping each other, they were helping other people. If there was a flood or an earthquake, they were sacrificing. This may be the first time in human history that there was a group of people sacrificing of their time, attention, and comfort for the good of someone else just out of love and out of altruism. And so we've done it before, right? And there have been many cases of this, but I would say that's what a world looks like where um, you know, you're, you're consistently culturally and socially uh, sacrificing for the good for the good of, of the other and for the good of, of community. Wayne Wilson. Hey. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.